during the journey almost i was bankrupt four to five times the first bankruptcy close to bankruptcy was scary but once when you got through that the second one or third one was not scary the fourth one was not even alarming so you get used to it and you only look at how to rectify things and go ahead and the first fear was high so the option was if i would have failed i would have gone for some employment that to not a glorified employment so that was the only option see if you are taking bath in a cold water the first dabba is the one that is just giving cold shivers the second and third doesn't give it so the first jerk gave nerves but the second and third didn't bother us From selling ice cream on pushcarts in the 1970s to chairing the largest private sector dairy company in India, it's true that R.G. Chandramogan has seen the entire spectrum of running a business over 50 years now. His company, Hats and Agro, is over a 7,000 crore plus company, not valuation, mind you, that's revenue, that has pioneered a unique model of directly producing, procuring milk from over 4 lakh farmers and selling branded consumer-facing products. I'm pretty sure you've enjoyed an ice cream or two from any of the Hudson brands during the sweltering Indian summer. Haroon ice creams and Ibaco come to mind. And if you're in the South, you couldn't have missed them. In Hudson, Mr. Chandra Morgan and his team have managed to create a business that's built to last using the first principles of frugality, resilience, and of course, compounding, which is our theme for today. Interestingly though, when asked about being a billionaire, he had famously replied, all this is national wealth. I don't consider myself to be a billionaire. In fact, the only asset I have is the house. such as the humility of the man himself it's an honor today sir to have you on board for this episode of the bloom podcast mr chandra morgan thank you thank you for joining us i think people would love to hear what it was to be an entrepreneur in the 70s we don't have too many of those born then and thriving today so your childhood and young adult life from the book you know mr damodaran put out and which i had the opportunity to read earlier this year So the story has been told for the first time. So not everyone might have read it, but I got a glimpse of it. So I picked up some of those. There's an anecdote where you know you have to skip your pre-university exams. Your seed capital was all of thirteen thousand rupees after you sold off a family property. Would love to hear from that point in whatever way you want to characterize it for young entrepreneurs. What gave you that courage to start Hudson? Why did it feel like it was going to work? And any specific learnings that you remember? which were instrumental in those early years of hats see i hail from a village called trutangal hmm. near shivgasi all along in my life in my childhood i haven't seen a senior executive okay the executive ladder was not known to us hmm. so only people whom we know were small traders or successful business people or whatever it is that's right so my exposure was limited hmm. to that extent hmm. so i also felt that probably i can be an entrepreneur one day <laughs> okay that's number one okay Number two, our village was completely a barren landed portion. Okay. So two people brought prosperity to those places. Mm. They brought matches. Their name was Ayanadar and Shamganadar. They brought prosperity to that land. Mm. They were like demigods to those people. Understood. Because they gave employment to thousands of people around mm. Shivakasi. Mm. So that was. a childhood aspiration that one day we can also emulate lovely lovely so th- it was it was the motivation to create an impact for the people that you grew up that's number 1 number 2 actually my father was running a small business here hmm. it was failing hmm. i was a class rank holder hmm. but the circumstances indicated that for long he will not continue in business okay on those days in my village the people join their father that's for right. an activity correct cutting the education that was very common so i also indicated that i'll join hmm. but he was adamant that i have to go to us study there that was only a ambition ambition he didn't know where to study in us i didn't know what to study in us correct so it was too early days yeah and one thing i was so sure that he can't find money to sponsor my trip to us ticket also forget about the education so that was the irony of it. 
the US has lost our gains, sir. So it's all good. His ambition was to send me to US and probably study there and stay there. Yeah. It didn't work. Hmm. So I lost my interest in education. Hmm. Deliberately, I didn't study that well in PUC, but uh, I, except one subject, I passed in all the subjects. Hmm. I failed. On those days, we had to write all exams together. Hmm. So my father insisted that you have to write the exam again because his ambition of sending me to US <laughs> has to work for him. Sure. I was so frustrated. Yeah. Next time, I never studied anything. Yeah. I went to the exam hall. It was blank. Oh. First question paper was chemistry. Hmm. Same chemistry, I was scored distinction on the first time. But hmm. this time, paper looked to me as if the language was Latin. Hmm. So, I had no interest. Hmm. By 2.15, I got up. Hmm. Told the examiner, I'm quitting the hall. <laughs> I'm totally unprepared. Okay. The examiner had some sympathy. Okay. The man said, uh, don't do it. Hmm. And I'll help you to pass this exam. Okay. And uh, only when you pass the exam, hmm. you will get a government job. Hmm. Get 1,500 rupees salary and settle well if I your future. I said, any day, government job is not my option. Okay. Maybe I don't like the smell of the government buildings. I'm not going to be a part of a government employee. Okay. I'm not going. Okay. I'm quitting the hall anyway. Even if you are going to help me in this exam, next exam, I'm equally prepared. Hmm. It's not going to help. Then he said, statutory demands that you should be here till 2.30. Half an hour, because I can admit anybody inside. Yeah. So you can leave the hall only after 2.35. Okay. Think of your future. Hmm. You are putting your future in a peril. Hmm. Then 2.35, I got up, gave the paper and walked out. I saw two cinemas. Not that I was so enjoying cutting the exam. Bloody hell, probably I was so frustrated. Yeah. I was in turmoil. Yeah. I know that probably I am going against the wishes of my father and family. Yeah. To just uh, escape, I went to two cinemas, mm. spent the whole night roaming around and then went back to my home. Mm. That's the beginning. Mm. Now, I wanted to do something on my own. Mm. Seeing the early entrepreneurs of Shivkasi. Understood. They were your role models then. Yeah. That was my mm. aspiration. Mm. Then, uh, after a year, hmm. after the cutting of exam, I was sent to a timber shop for training in Budupuram. Okay. I worked there for a year. Hmm. And probably I was an outstanding salesman. Hmm. Some policy issues, there was a conflict of interest from me to hmm. the boss. Hmm. Then I quit the job. Hmm. So my family felt that probably they have got a useless fellow. He goes to the exam, he cuts the exam. And one lakh guys are writing the exam. This guy is the only guy who is going out of the exam. And then we get a job. He resigns the job without communicating to us and comes back. So there was friction. Hmm. Then finally, 13,000 rupees was given by selling an ancestral property. Hmm. Hmm. Then I started. Hmm. So the ice cream company was, with that budget, I could start only that. The beggars are not choosers. I didn't have money. There was no venture capitalist on those days. Correct. Or for that matter, I had any great idea of how to raise the money. Yeah. Something went on. Even the banks used to be very skeptical about funding the ice cream uh, initial yeah. people and all that. Yeah. So this is the way we started. That's how it started. No, no, amazing. Amazing. Congratulations again on a well-deserved biography that Mr. Damodaran has spent. which recently won uh, the Gaja Capital Award as well. The citation says... It's an inspiration for every entrepreneur to s see how you've constantly tried, failed, learned, pivoted, then scaled, right? And that's the biggest fear entrepreneurs have, right? In terms of what if it doesn't work? And it turns out that more people, you know, get defeated by the circumstances. They might have either taken venture capital, they can't get more capital, they haven't figured out how to turn profitable. How has that shaped you as a person? How does it make you get better and better and any near misses there? Could this company have been dead a few times in that journey? See, if you ask me, I didn't have alternative options. I didn't have the education. Yeah. Or I didn't have option to even think that I can juggle from here to there. There's no, no plan B. No failure plan. So, <laughs> no plan B. So, I have to stick with whatever the irony I am fitted with. Yeah. So, I am back to the wall. Mm. There was no way that I can just look at alternatives which are rosy, mm. number one. Mm. During the journey, mm. almost I was bankrupt four to five times. Mm. The first bankruptcy, close to bankruptcy was scary. But once when you got through that, 
The second learned. one, the third one was not scary. The fourth one was not even alarming. So you get used to it. And uh, you only look at how to rectify things and go ahead. And the first fear was high. Yeah. So the option was, if I would have failed, I would have gone for some employment. That too, not a glorified employment. Correct. So that was the only option. Hmm. See, if you are taking bath in cold water, the first dabba is the one that is just giving cold shivers. Correct. The second and third doesn't give it. So the first jerk gave nerves. But the second and third didn't bother us much. You overcome them. Great anecdotes and great lessons. So the two personality-driven things, and you know, a lot has uh, been said about you in that book, but I've heard of this even before, being a Chennai boy. But how come you wouldn't choose to uh, give the company a name that attached the family name or your personal name? I think it runs deep, but how did you have that vision and why did you choose to call it Hatson? Where did the name come from? No, no, Hatson came much later. Okay. It's not the day one. Day one, sir. The day one, the name of the company was Chandra Mohan Company. Oh, it was? It, it was in my name. Yeah. In 1986 only, we coined the name Hatson. Got it. And any motivations to do that? Partly because you wanted the brand to stay? No, stay. actually, probably we were only into ice cream business ah, at that time. Correct. 1993, 94 only. We yeah, today. until Arun Ice Cream was so yeah, around. Actually, we were trying to kind a name suitable for a brand like ice cream. Understood. We were trying to say that probably this can be a protection against the sun. The hot sun, yeah. So, Hudson was the real name we looked at. Hat that protects the Hudson probably looked a little way different. Then we made it as Hudson. Got it. Our researchers dug up an interview way back in 2007 where he said, you don't do too many interviews because the brand and the product should speak about the company, not the personalities behind it. Do you think it still holds true and would you have done things differently in becoming the brand persona for the values that you have and for the products that you sell? Actually, see, my feeling is if you promote yourself along with the brands, yeah. you are promoting a dual brand. Hmm. The risk of the dual brand is once when the demise happens to the founder, yeah. he is going to put a lot of pressure on the successor. People may believe that he is the only guy who can just make it or not. The organization should run on autopilot system. That's right. With proper systems and proper management. Getting glorified as a, maybe founder recognition is okay, but still always on the limelight trying to get things means you are actually putting the company at a risk. Mm. For the successor to th do things in a proper manner. Understood. So we don't want to have that type of pressure. For uh, Though I would say so that this is a mindset of someone who already knows you're going to build a generational company, which will actually move a few generations and get professionally managed, which is what I think the startup ecosystem is struggling to build towards. Like how do I build a two generation or a two decade or a three decade company? Would you say that's true? Sir? See... Everybody says there is a goal and I want to reach the goal. Yeah. After reaching the goal, the complacency sets in. Yeah. So I don't have a goal. Mm. My journey is infinity. Mm. Why should I bother about that goal in the next one year, two years? And then after the goal, probably I want to relax and I want to enjoy my life. Yeah. See, I enjoy doing my job. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for me, the journey is important, not yeah. the destination. Yeah. So that is the way we take it. Again, if you look at companies, we have built four successful brands. Aruna Ice Cream is today one of the top two, three brands in the country. That's right. Arogya Milk is supposed to be the largest private corporate milk brand. Milk brand. Hudson Curd is one of the top two brands in the country. Okay. Ibaco is one among the two top premium brands of ice cream. Normally, people build one brand. Hmm. Or even three, four generations, the same brand continues. Hmm. The second or third brand doesn't emerge. Yeah. The creativity is struck at that one brand. Mm. And they try to duplicate what they have done to the first brand to the second brand. Mm. If you are going from first brand to second brand, mm. you have to do a lot of unlearning to build a second brand. Mm. Say, for example, mm. Arun Ice Cream sales starts by 11 o'clock in the morning. Correct. But the peak sales is between 7 to 10 in the night. That's right. Whether it is summer or not. Yeah. 7 to 10 is the time of consumption. Yeah. The milk sales starts by... 4 to 5 in the morning yeah. and over by 6.30. That's correct. Done. Collections are done. So if I apply the same formula for Arun Ice Cream to Arugya Milk, I'm not doing any. Mm -hmm. So I have to do unlearning. Mm. So comparatively, we have built four brands. 
All the very different business. And all the brands are market leaders in its own segment. Fantastic. I mean, it's explained in that large 7,000 crore plus revenue. So <laughs> none of us are doubting that. So I'm going to take you a little through the Hudson journey itself. Maybe, again, a lot of literature covers the success of when Hudson moved out of ice creams into, not moved out, rather started the milk business as well. But then I think there were three, four challenges and maybe you can break your answer up into this, sir. One is, it was not the country that we had today. So you needed cold chain infrastructure to put together milk collection. Of course, there was an Amul which had, you know, started enabling this, but no private players had the courage to go and maybe replicate this at scale. And three, there was an incumbent in Tamil Nadu, like most co-ops, which was Arvin, right? So suddenly in the early 90s, what prompted you, other than backward integration from your ice cream business, to say that I'm ready to take on all of these folks and win? All these challenges and win. Ice cream business, we were having a factory in Chennai. Mm. And uh, we wanted to expand the factory. Mm. The next season was applying pressure because the sales was growing. Mm. Literally, if you look at it, mm. we built our Arun ice cream market from the potential market. Mm. And we never worked on getting a market share from the existing market. Mm. Existing market was available only in Chennai. Okay. Chennai was having Das Prakash as the state number one brand. That's right. Quality was India's number one brand. Jai was India's number two brand. Mm. All the people were prominently available. Mm. Mm. And we were relatively unknown. Yeah. No brand. Mm. And we didn't have the muscles to give freezers. Mm. So we didn't have money. Mm. So literally what we have done is, we tried to go around mm. and build a market in outstations. Mm. We are the pioneers in going to the outstation market for ice cream. We built a market. And on those days, we were giving parlors. And the ice cream distribution is a very tough challenge on those days because there was no culture. That's correct. So what we used to do is we used to pack our ice cream with dry ice and put it on trains, oh. the regular trains. Okay. And the people who is the agent at their town, we we'll book it, it and he has to take delivery and take it to his outlet. So this, we were doing it for years. Oh, wow. And uh, we started our journey in 81, mm. 82, mm. I say. Before 86, when we came back to Chennai, mm. we were market leaders of Tamil Nadu. Mm. Without the three players knowing that we have already overtaken. So, we created a market that was only a potential market, which was non-existent, we created. Coming back to outstation is a major chunk of business. Mm. Outstation business also, apart from parlors, we have later diverted to points and other things. And today we have the heavy network. Now, the idea of 1991 was to start an ice cream factory, which will have a lesser logistical distance. So, we chose Salem. Okay. Salem, logically, Salem by itself is a major, major town, town of Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Koyamathur, Tirupur, Trichy, Madurai. Correct. All the places are within 3-4 hours. That's direction. right. Very central. Then. then, we started going through van delivery from the nearby point. So, reducing logistics. Milk prices were low because it is a, supported by villages. And our land prices were low. Yeah. Our wages were comparatively less than Tamil Nadu. So, we had a lot of advantages to produce ice cream at Salem. Then we started. After starting ice cream, liberalization was introduced for milk. Earlier, it was reserved for co-ops. Understood. And uh, once when it was served, we never started milk. Mm. We started a milkshake powder. Mm. We wanted to market a consumer product. The milkshake powder, it didn't click. Yes. It was a failure. Yeah. See, the market, you go with a perception. That's right. You have to take a shot. The consumer has got a different perception. Yes. Not that you study the consumer 100% of the times and probably you are successful. Make a mistake, you correct it and probably go with a different version or whatever it is. Yeah. So, in this case, what happened? Our product was well accepted. Mm. Everybody liked it. Mm. The biggest problem was, we were telling the milkshake powder, you put some milkshake powder, put some ice water, put some ice cubes, churn it in the mixie, you will get a fresh milkshake and you can drink. Now, housewife was concerned about putting ice in the mixie. She felt the mixie's break, blades uh, will get It will damage the blades. Damaged. See, this is something that we didn't anticipate. Yeah. So, it boomerang. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. We were stuck with the product. Mm. We were making heavy losses. Mm. That was the first limited company with some of my friends' investment I started. Mm. So, we invested about uh, 60%. The rest of that 40% came from my friends. 
it was losing. Mm. This was also at Salem at a different location within 3-4 kilometers. Mm. Mm. Then, second thing was, this particular milkshake powder was doing better in the summer times and winter times the sales falls. Correct. The milk arrival at the winter is higher. Milk arrival in the summer is low. So, we have to dispose of the excess milk. Wow. We were in some problem. Hmm. Then we decided, we met some people, friends and other people. Then we got into milk. We were forced because probably the failed venture, we have to come out of it means the milk was the only option. 95 July 10th, we introduced milk. The reason I brought up Avin is, a farmer, milk farmer is set in his or her ways, right? And how do you convince someone like that to work with someone? How did you execute that? Or how was those? How were those conversations? Governments have got their own attractions. Hmm. People are blind hmm. to go with the governments. Hmm. This is one set of people. Hmm. The other set of people also are there. Hmm. Who wants a better reaction from hmm. somebody hmm. for their representation and all that. Hmm. At that time when we launched, hmm. Avin was almost delaying the payment for farmers by about three months. Two oh, wow. Months. But still, there hmm. were loyal farmers Correct. who felt that they are the only alternative. Some guy may come today, he may buy milk, he may not pay for 15 days, he will run away. Hmm. The government, with the government, the money is always going to come someday. Hmm. Then we got, came into milk procurement. Hmm. And we had tough times in milk procurement. And uh, we gave a stability hmm. of making payment hmm. every 10th day. Hmm. We are doing it from the year 1995 till this date, 28 years. Hmm. And we have given that type of stability, hmm. which improved our competitors also to pay in time. You may brought a change in the industry in some sense, because you forced that. Time. They were forced. Yeah. Second thing on marketing, hmm. on those days, if somebody wants 100 liters of milk, hmm. he requires a minister's recommendation or something to get that supply of 100 liters for a marriage party. So that was the situation in Chennai. Okay. And it was a monopoly. Okay. Though the industry was said to be liberalized, it was not liberalized. Okay. They had an order called MMP order. Ah. The peculiar thing is, Delhi Animal Husbandry will forward a letter ah. on our application to the local state saying so and so has applied for uh, doing so much of milk and uh, do you have surplus? Mm. Will you please give us NOC for mm. giving license? Mm. Our friends will say there is no milk availability, surplus is not there. So it has to be rejected. It will be rejected. Mm. Then we have to make an appeal to the Joint Secretary. Joint Secretary will ask for a hearing. Wow. Present IAS will go there. They will be batchmates. They will just talk over a cup of coffee and then say that uh, this is not worth giving and he will also say no. Somehow, Secretary was convinced that it is time to liberalize and probably gave the permission. Fantastic. No, it always takes one, one or two minds to push that development. Uh, whether... Finally, probably we got through yeah. and then we started. Once when we came into market, yeah. two things happened. Everybody who was licensed on those days, the local cooperative was marketing toned milk. Toned milk is 3% fat and 8.5% yes. Yeah. They were all trying to duplicate. Understood. The problem of this particular duplication was mm. they themselves were not making money. When there is a loss making company as a monopoly, yeah. you go with a similar product. They pick the wrong role models. That was a benchmark. And uh, once when we started milk, our yeah. people were saying that we should also make toned milk. Yeah. But we should price it 50 paise less than the local cooperative. Hmm. If we price it 50 paise less than the cooperative and give the toned milk, hmm. that is the most fastest way to go to bankruptcy. I said, uh, this is not the business model we can look at. Yeah. Otherwise, we can close the milkshake factory and write off. Fair enough. It is not worth Thus, playing this game. Eight and us less and going in a market share, mm. they are not going to revise the prices, whatever the losses they are making. Mm. Forget it. We will go for standardized milk, mm. which is 4.5% and 8.5%. Mm. And you market it as a USP and charge 2 rupees more. They were charging 7 rupees. I was asking them to charge 9 rupees. That's a lot in those days, yeah. All the, the production guy, we used to have a good meetings on those days. Yeah. Production guy, marketing guy, procurement guy, all the people were there. Yeah. My next deputy was my classmate, Mr. Dandrajan. All the people were of the uniform opinion, mm. this will not work. Mm. They were saying that you are asking for the moon. This yeah. is not going to be done. Mm. 
and this 9 rupees will not work out hmm. and we have to market it at 50 paise less we said now at least we will market it the same price no asking <laughs> for an extra price yeah so the discussion went on for about 3 hours i used to go to selam once in a week hmm. for 2 days hmm. i was supposed to return back the discussion started by 6:30 mm. went on till 9:30 mm. i had a train to catch by 10:45 mm. then i said by 9:30 i have heard you enough i am vetoing it so we are going to go with standardized milk four and a half and uh, as you people are scared you market four and a half percent at 7 rupees for three months huh. then you will take it to eight three months later after three months you will take it to nine though higher inputs more losses i am willing to take it for 3 months and we will give a better product and get into market impress the people gradually increase the price risky bet but we have anyway failed in milk in milkshake <laughs> so this is the way we came away from the run of the milk competition understood then the run of the milk competition started copying us as market leaders later mm. we are also like arogya and but the initial break we gave our people were not confident yeah the marketing guys and other people they felt that i am pushing them yeah it may not work hmm but they were going and working but the heart and soul was not there okay that was my feeling so i wanted to give them a little better confidence i sent a mail to mr paul rice uh-huh. wrote the book marketing war warfare yeah so i wrote to him saying that probably i want a consultancy from you ah uh-huh. for a bloody losing company i wanted a consultancy from him i said will you be in a position to come to india and offer consult yeah i didn't get any reply okay second mail i sent mm. again he didn't reply mm. the third one anyway i was going to us for some work okay the third mail ice cream was arun ice cream was doing well mm. arun ice cream was already crossed the break even and it was paying mm. then i sent a mail saying that i am planning to be in us this place was atlanta mm. i prefer to meet you in atlanta mm. in case if you find some time Hmm. Then within three hours, I got a reply. <laughs> I gave her a mail in the late evening, and the guy replied in the morning, first time. Yeah, said you are most welcome, and probably I can book the room here. Hmm. And uh, you, from the airport, you can come to this room, and I will come and pick you up and all that. So then we met. Nice. Then he said, Chandra Mohan, uh, I saw you both your mails. I felt an Indian entrepreneur may not be willing to pay my fee. Okay. So hence, I was reluctant to reply. <laughs> so he thought that is a junk mail and probably this yeah. happened in Sunday 97 97 when we were already marketing for and a percent fat milk at some places then i asked him probably what is that uh, you demand as a fees hmm. he said 30000 us per day oh wow 30000 us per day and for him and his daughter lara to come all the way here lara has also written a forward in our book yes i saw that yeah Lara and himself to come in business class hmm. and to stay here in the hotel. I also tied up with two of my friends here. One is Renal Spen at that time and the Shiram Chits. Okay, both are good friends. Yeah, I negotiated with them, saying you want to charge thirty thousand. <laughs> you want to travel one day to India and one day back, and one day you are going to be there. I'll give you three days assignment. Hmm. Three different companies. Sixty <laughs> thousand US hmm. for three days. Yeah, stay is given, room is given. Uh, everything we will provide so we shared the expenses as one third one third two and 20000 us plus the hotel and other things one day he took the session for our sales people marketing people our senior people and all that he was convinced yeah don't get into tone the milk of the competition yeah and the stand what you have taken is the right one hmm. so he required an american to come and endorse me at that time the 20000 us dollars the <laughs> the exchange rate was not uh, 81 so we spent about 13 and a half lakhs on those days including the flight ticket yeah. uh, one third of our share and all that okay he took a one day session uh-huh. our people put all the apprehension hmm. finally he said don't try to say you are giving standardized milk versus stone milk hmm. people don't understand what is stone milk first of all correct it's a technical jargon that's right you are playing the mind has got a little space hmm. you should simplify it Hmm. What is that standardized milk you are trying to say? Hmm. We said four and a half percent fat. Hmm. That is three percent fat. That's more than enough. He said four and a half. He put it in the board, made a round. He said market it as four and a half percent milk. That's it. That's all that he had to do. So that is sometimes the genius of marketing. Don't you think, sir? 
this simply gets registered. See, he says, mind is a crowded place. Yeah. There are too many communications. Yeah. Too many brands they have to remember. Unless you give some specifics, they will not remember. So don't say standardized milk. Don't say torn milk. You say it's four and a half percent milk. You went for four and a half percent milk. We put a teaser. We supported with the advertisements and all that. Finally, it worked well. My JMD was just uh, very apprehensive <laughs> on the day of the meeting. He said, you brought this man all the way from US. Yeah. Paying 13 and a half lakhs. Yeah. He has put four and a half and put around. I could have done it myself. <laughs> I said, you should have done it much before him. And also, you should have a logic to convince our people. Yeah. You didn't have a logic. You are arguing against me. Yeah. Now you are uh, saying that this man is charging. Team was cut. This conviction came because yeah. A rank outsider is evaluating it. Yeah. And he's a management guru. Mm. And he's also from US gives a credibility. Yeah. So it's a great lesson in uh, organization building. Sometimes you need that external validation. We've seen this now as we completed a decade a few years ago. We also struggling to get everybody to understand what we were saying to each other because we said if you're building for the next few decades, we need a lot of structure in the way we push ahead. And finally, we had to bring uh, equivalent of an organizational coach, then put in leadership coaches. But as you rightly said, it is to validate these fears and concerns and prepare everybody on a sort of common mission. And as much as a founder, you feel like, I think founders do get taken a little for granted, don't you think? So? I know they are accepting to do the job, what I am saying. But I was not convinced whether they were fully convinced to do the job. Once when they don't have a conviction, the delivery is going to be not to the optimum. Absolutely. So now, they were fully bought out. I'm going to weave in a small personal anecdote and ask, have you ask a couple of questions on Arun Ice Cream. And I, I know I've mentioned this to you before the podcast started, but love relationship with Arun Ice Cream goes into the 80s. We grew up in Chennai, me and my brother. And my brother actually used to run into your son, the current CEO cycling down uh, the road where we both stayed. So I think our paths overlapped. Of course, I did not know you at that point. And we were huge fans. And uh, you talked about how you used a very unique strategy to go and win markets that your competition didn't know existed. And then you came to Chennai. And all I can remember is downing hundreds of uh, chocobars and kasatas, which were my favorite when I grew up. Also, very unique marketing plays. The one I remember distinctly, uh, as, as I saw it in the book, rewind it to that day when I went to that Egmore place and ate all-you-can-eat ice cream. Gilda's, Gilda's service in 1987. Gilda's. So, I can't imagine how much I ate, but it was like all-you-can-eat for what, 30 rupees or something of that? 8 rupees. 8 rupees, sorry, even worse. Yeah. So, 30, I'm, I'm calibrating to current prices. And, you know, you did these unique things. So, two things. One, how did you win Chennai? Is it simply quality, price, these marketing genius? And dozens of brands have come after that. So why do people go back to Arun? I know Ibaco started to cater to the premium segment. Uh, just maybe some gems from your flagship. Arun is the heart of the company, I feel sometimes. At least as I know it. See, Arun Ice Cream, once when we were trying to build up in the city, hmm. after winning the outstation, hmm. more than the advertisement, the ice cream mela, what we have conducted was unique. Mm. It was covered by all newspapers and magazines. Mm. So it gives a wide publicity mm. and word of mouth. Both are free compared to advertisement. Yeah. And uh, we built a brand over it. And, and basically, how come that, does, that works for one year at a time, right? Do you think you've always won via marketing or product? And what has happened to other brands no, which no, have tried to challenge This is almost it? like breaking the ice in the initial stage. That's correct. And making the brand known. Then probably you support it with advertisements and other things and you start going with the market. In this 50-year journey now, that is it, is it the 50th year or? 53rd year. 53rd. You've worked with like, you know, building multiple businesses. And did you see that as the, and I'm moving now gently into the compounding journey, right? We went from the story of how ice creams moved to milk. Uh, it was a necessity play at that juncture. And I know you know these numbers. I think the one time we have met and somebody introduced us, it was a 10-minute conversation, but you spoke about this 1 crore, 10 crore, 100 crore, 1,000 crore sales of the company. I would love for you to recount that for the audiences. So how long did it take to get to 1, 10, the logarithmic expansion? And that, in some sense, defines the power of compounding, right? So if you can replay that for the audiences, that would be great, sir. 
see, we started in 1970. Yeah. First eight, ten years has been a struggling period. We didn't move anywhere. Hmm. We first year we made a turnover of one lakh and fifteen thousand for the whole year, hmm. and maybe we did four point two five lakhs ten years later in nineteen oh, eighty. Wow. Hmm. So just grew four times in ten years. But it is mostly through inflation. So this has not helped us much of a. Today, if you recall, hmm. that first ten years sales, we can do it under thirty minutes. Wow. First twenty years sales, we can do it under one day. Wow. Thirty years, we can do it within a month. Amazing. Forty years, we can do it under a year. It has been a gradual pace. Yeah. So it's a journey of endurance and patience, nothing else. But probably over a period, gradually things started emerging. No, fantastic, fantastic numbers, sir. So the one question in that context I had was, do you see natural market saturations or geographic saturations? So compounding is almost in India, given how tight a market it is. Customers look for. you know every rupee of value that they can get you can't you know bloat up employees employee salaries overnight so when you look at the constraints that india throws at you there is a natural market saturation that tends to happen right and does that prompt you to then say i need other business models to come and help me on the compounding other products to help me on the compounding so did that force the creation of four great brands or you know did that just happen as a natural evolution and you're very happy with that journey as you said you were at, you didn't set a goal for yourself as much as i'll go where the journey takes me see we are one people mm we started as a tiny industry mm gradually we went to small mm from small to medium mm medium to big big to large mm so this five different transitions mm where the time i'm saying that probably i was close to getting broke mm see each transition was a different lesson to us mm what we did at one stage we had to do completely reverse on the other stage that's correct maybe tiny we were doing everything our myself mm. and uh, when it came to small we had a very small team mm. which was under instruction they were doing the job correct we didn't have a thinking staff mm. so once when you start going to medium mm. you require subordinates to do the job it requires colleagues to do the job yes they have to think themselves yes so every stage my thinking process has to change of course when it comes to large hmm mostly i am not doing any work i am only into strategy and planning and finance yes but rest of the people are performing on the field of course so i can't lead from the front i have to go to the back seat hmm allow the other people to perform hmm but these people have to think and work hmm these colleagues hmm are much different from the people whom i hired on the day one hmm day one i required people who carry out my instructions of course everywhere things are changed i had one accountant who was writing the book yes today we call it as a, a cfo correct an accounts manager probably an internal audit yes. chief cost accountant company secretary see one job yeah one simple thing what we were doing we are having too many people you take marketing branding is separate marketing is separate selling is different see different selling of different brands so all these things over a period in my lifetime i have to see i have to get educated to adapt to the new condition no we keep saying that sir i think the biggest role for a founder ceo is that they actually don't know the job that awaits them 5 years 10 years in advance you almost have to go and learn how to become that person you will be in 5 10 years and the best best ceos uh, founder ceos we've seen evolve over like a decade or two are folks who are incredible learners themselves you have to have a lot of humility to know that you have to be a very different type of leader at i think 5 10000 you know crores as you were when you were at 50 to 100 crores would you would you broadly agree with my assessment sir of that no mostly i'll say the refusal to learn yeah gets in at some time hmm people start working for basics hmm and then for comforts hmm then the ego comes in people recognize you wherever you go yeah and all that lot of people get settled at ego gratification beyond that point 
Yeah. They are just in the limelight and probably they feel that the journey is already over. Understood. So this type of attitude, once on it comes in. Yeah. This can also be. Yeah. The entrepreneur is the asset at the beginning and he will become the biggest liability at a later date. Once and he becomes complacent or arrogant. Hmm. Complacency and arrogance can creep in hmm. with the personal success. You have to be careful not to get complacent, not to get arrogant. So these two things are the real destroyer of any future journey. No, well said, sir. I think there's a philosophical tone to your answer, which I think I'm hoping a lot of young entrepreneurs learn from. That's who I'm doing this podcast for. So I hope they take that lesson. There's this corollary to what you just said, which is, I know you built this business in an era where private capital did not exist. So we'll come to the public part of the journey, but it forced you to go public. You also didn't have the luxury of ever losing money in any given year. That is what you call as near bankruptcy in your case. But as you grow to this middle, large, really where you're at today, uh, how difficult or easy is it? Because I want more founders to think in that fashion. Can they build lasting organizations uh, rather than simply be in the venture race for the first five, eight years? So at some point, even when you're playing the venture capital money, which comes fast and quick and expects you to grow unreasonably, if you don't turn to a profitable cash flow business, your fate is at the mercy of either you get acquired by somebody who wants you as an asset or eventually you might flame out, right? And this is a very trying time for entrepreneurs. So how do you build the culture of a profitability slash frugality, this balance of, you know, growth versus profitability? And how do you sustain it when you have to get top talent to come and run the company, which is very different from where the company uh, talent base was, say, 20 years ago? See, in the year 1996, we went public. Yeah. We, ra- we tried to raise eight crores. We barely did it. There were comments in the newspaper, very negative comments were there. They said, uh, empty cone for the investors, <laughs> uh, cream for the promoters. See, uh, all fancy slogans, uh, they felt they were very creative in writing slogans and all this nonsense we saw. Think what we did was, fortunately or unfortunately, mm. no PE invested in our first venture. It was all uh, distributed to public. We had long-term investors. Mm. I'm really scared of getting PE money. They come with an agenda of five years or ten years. Hmm. They wanted to get out. Hmm. At the time of entry, they want to decide the exit. That's correct. Once when they do it, in the five years, they try to pressurize the company. Yeah. And they say, you give a statement like this. In three years, I will do that. Hmm. I will go to moon and I will go to Mars. So that type of statements. Hmm. And these statements are going to hound the entrepreneur very difficult uh, to chase. Mm. Say in five years, I will do so much of turnover. Mm. And the five years, COVID may come. Economical recession may come. Too many things may happen. Yeah, not But still that five years, answerability stays. That's right. So, we had the fortune of not committing towards the future. Mm. If somebody is going to ask me. Mm. We have our inner plan, details and all that. If they say that in five years, will you do so much? Mm. I always say, I am no Nostradamus. Hmm. to predict the future. The reason is, if you are committing for the future, yeah. for a third party, yeah. or to the press, or to the open community, what happens is, then you start chasing vanity and the business goes out of sanity. You start compromising because you said that you will do so much of turnover hmm. and you try to do all juggernauts to do that. Hmm. And the PE would have pressurized and you would have walked out. Hmm. So, I don't want to get into the trap. Mm. I don't give any futuristic projection to the market saying, I'm going to do this, that and all that. Understood. We have in heart what we want to do and we want to do it without pressures. If there is going to be COVID or anything, we would like to take the shock as much as possible. Yeah. We'll be far more efficient than our competitor to come out of it. That is the only thing we can do. Correct. And we don't want to commit to anybody that we are going to do that. Hmm. Maybe our past record can just speak to them. Hmm. If they are happy, let them be. That's right. Now you've established that over 27 years. So basically they've seen you deliver year after year after year. And eventually you have to get to that point where As investors trust you. are talking you. about compounding. Yeah. The guy who invested 45 rupees 
with me in 1996 for a 10 rupee share today he has got 28 shares of 1 rupee wow. bonus and all that the amount of 45 what he has invested today is about 32648 amazing yeah on today's market price hmm and we have compounded 27.63% over the period of 96 to 27 years 2023 yeah 20 yeah years. 27 years sir 27 years we have compounded it at a speed of 27.63 insane insane compound this is wealth part of it yeah for the same 45 rupees we are giving a dividend of 165 rupees per year oh the last 4 5 years mm. 28 shares are getting that is coming to 165 that is a bonus bonus over and above so this is this is the power of his true. capital yeah now i started with 13000 whatever forbes says if it is true market capitalization that they call it yeah this 13000 on the present market cap we have compounded by 36.52% over 53 years yeah over 53 years i checked up at warren buffett record for 55 years if you have invested 10000 us it is today worth about 280 million us yeah at 20% cagr but the gentleman has invested into different companies and see there is an average for him there yes. may be a company which is given much better return yeah some other company would have given lesser return yeah and he has got a, a basket of products yeah i have only one product one company i stay with it and i don't have any basket i have no regrets no absolutely absolutely i mean it's it's a iconic company now sir i mean it, it gives us pride to say that a company like this was built out of chennai and thank you for that i still consider it hometown thanks for giving those numbers i wouldn't have been able to do the math this is fantastic for the audience too yeah on other compounding drivers i know we didn't answer that question fully how important are people culture technology and specifically in tech we are a big beneficiary stellaps uh, uh, one of our companies i think when they were looking around speaking to a uh, private dairy where they thought they'll get a break i think hatson was the first company that gave a break and if you look at your biography as well there's a history of you making very bold technology bets ahead of everyone so my people might not see a state direct to consumer brands company doing milk and yogurt and ice creams as technology but i tend to see that the best performers in this are great adopters of technology early so that that's our angle because we're also a tech investor but broadly if you look at the drivers of compounding do you have a sequence or do you have a, a group of value drivers that actually allowed for this crazy growth this you know you, as you said i do 40 years worth of revenue in like one year how does that happen like what is the magic of of that what is the magic formula we were comparatively frugal in personal we were putting all money back into only one company hmm. i stayed in rented house from 1970 to 30 years hmm. so i moved to my own house only in 2000 after 30 years hmm. this office last year we moved hmm. till such time we were in rented office hmm. so all the 52 years we were in rented office and this is the first time we are moving to our own office hmm. but our factories are heavily modernized hmm. we invest into productive assets and non productive assets we try to avoid understood house i consider it as a non productive office i consider it as a non productive yeah but today government is taxing rent at 18% that is making it prohibitively high yeah i felt that i can go for a new office pay the bank interest where i don't have to pay gst the milk doesn't have the facility to absorb the gst so we decided to go with it and again probably we pioneered too many things hmm. two of the guys came from uh, boston okay primitive powers hmm. those people they came to india and they said your power supplies are frequently disrupted we can cool the milk with a solar system okay install okay but they don't have money hmm. the guy got a award from uh, mit hmm. for uh, developing new products and, mm. that, and they approached me mm. they said they don't have the seed capital can you help us mm. we will develop a system and come and install mm. they wanted only 5000 us dollars we gave mm. the guys came and installed it worked but the problem was the space what they were asking 
hmm is not possible to be provided everywhere hmm i said this will not work hmm again in the winter hmm when the sunlight is not there we have to go back to that's right a generator this will not work then the guys went back hmm they came with the technology of thermal battery hmm today we have about 1500 machines doing the chilling it will not be necessary that the power is a must at the time of coming of the milk hmm so this will chill a liquid that liquid will take care of chilling of the milk and uh, they developed the technology they put up a factory in pune even okay. today we are the largest buyer so, so beyond technology any other levers uh, that have allowed you to grow to the scale the technology in the sense probably if you take our ice cream factory yeah this is a world class factory hmm technology wise today we are updated with any technology available in the world understood the best of the missionaries and all that yeah we are the first people to connect 4 lakh farmers digital payment we are the first people to do it in the entire country no cooperative has done it no private dairy has done it the reason why we did was hmm. we were literally having handing over cash it was calling for too many people and the cash that was given was also misused by the correct farmers wife is managing the family the farmer husband will collect the money you will go to taskmark and spend the money and go with the balance yeah so things were not running well yeah and the loan sharks used to lend the money understood loan sharks used to charge 6% interest and the banks considered them as not worthy customers most of the farmers they used to ask for a loan waiver yeah so at this juncture we brought the farmers into bank records that completely changed the farmers were initially against yeah they said you have been giving cash and we will not take check and all that we mm. said we did it at the peak of the flush where they can't run away to anybody we said this will work good for you yeah and then we did it yeah two things happened yeah today he is a worthy customer of a bank that's right earlier if he goes to the bank manager he will not allow him to meet him today the bank manager is at his door to service you want a education loan you want a animal loan you will give it correct today he is a worthy customer today if i am going to say farmer saying i will revert back to the old system of paying cash he will again revolt yes the thing is we did it much before liberalization we were already digitalized by 2015 oh fantastic i thought it was more a upi initiative much before that mm. actually harish damodar was introduced at that time okay. he came to know about us and he made a phone call okay he said how you people are managing payments it is giving sleepless night to all the people people are standing on queue i said probably my farmer and ourself myself are sleeping well <laughs> no issue so personal question sir so it's it's kept you going for 50 plus years have you ever felt like you know now it's time to sort of fully retire and now do you feel like the company is in hands where it can build as you said for eternity day to day i am not running day to day satyan is running mm. i am not into day to day and i don't get involved mm. but if there is something exciting something new where probably some new technology is coming say if somebody is talking about wave energy i prefer to go and see where the wave energy is understood so those things side yeah scientific the marketing tempo. side are probably on the finance side understood last question before i get to a set of fun rapid fire questions i mean you keep reading the papers now you hear stories of how we as venture capitalists are probably building a very different type of entrepreneur corrupting the mind with too much capital without necessarily comparing and critiquing what would your advice be for young entrepreneurs starting today very different environment a lot of private money you know and a lot of pressure also to deliver quicker outcomes how do you resist that how do you build today probably the most of the entrepreneurs are coming with a very good educational background that's correct again when they start a company they also decide to have exit date maybe it's new to me yeah. i am not used to that yeah i don't believe that probably exiting is worth yeah my pleasure is in doing the job yeah by getting the money yeah. what i will do with the money i don't know yeah it's a different mindset understood the question i am not competent to answer i can say my mindset is different so no, it's a great answer sir So thanks again uh, it's been a lovely hour or so before we wrap i thought we'll just ask you some fun questions one word one phrase one sentence whatever suits your uh, mood today what's your favorite ice cream flavor kasata okay that makes two of us 
I, I know. I feel like from memory's sake, I need to go and have one of those today. If not in the dairy business, where would you have been? I mean, do you ever think about another business that? I'd have retired in US, <laughs> working for Duponts or some other company. You've been in the business for more than forty years. What are the top three words of caution you'll give to young entrepreneurs? Frugality. If you are going to just go for a long run, yes, you need that. Sir. And uh, once when a failure comes, facing it with confidence, not getting biased by people around, they will always put negative sentiments that this will not work, that will not work, and all that. So believe in yourself better than. believing in others and one one piece of tech now that is consumed you that you think you can't live without i don't use technology the regular mails and other things i yeah i am not a technology freak in this in this journey when you look at these 53 years agility versus endurance what do you think has served you better endurance in the long run endurance so marathon versus sprints and so once again uh, sir been a pleasure thank you for the time today and it was great capturing the hatson journey as i said it has a lot of personal connection so i was very moved by the fact that you agreed to do this for us today we've had some fantastic guests on the show and i think this will add to a different flavor of not ice cream but learning for the the young founders who are listening in thank you again sir. thank you 